it reminded me of this interview that Jordan Peterson gave about a year or two ago when he was exploring Christianity and he was choked up in classic Jordan Peterson fashion. We love his vulnerability when he cries. And he literally said that he's terrified of Christ because he's terrified that what he finds could make a claim on him. And I think it's only a matter of time before he's Catholic. Welcome back to another episode of Miked Up. I'm your host, David Gordon, and I'm joined today by Catholic evangelist and apologist Bobby Hesley. And we're going to be talking today about the phenomenon of high profile public figures becoming Catholic and what's driving that. Um, how are you doing, Bobby? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I appreciate you having me. And uh, not too far from the Church Militant Studios, actually. I've been uh, friends with Michael since, man, 2008, since the old St. Michael's Media days. And uh, always follow what you guys do and uh, love what you do. Keep up the good work. Somebody's got to do it. So if it's somebody, it's you guys. <laughs> Thanks so much. No, and um, very kind words. And, and obviously your ministry uh, bears much fruit as well. Um, Thank you. So... It's worth diving into. It's not just uh, Catholics patting ourselves on the back like, oh, people are joining our club. Look at us. We're so special. Although, of course, we are. Um, but I, I want to, to look at this. We have, and these are the four hardest names to pronounce in the world. But as of, you know, the last year and a half, we have uh, people like Cameron Bertuzzi, uh, you know, big YouTube influencer, former Protestant, Shia LaBeouf, Gad El. Mala and Eva Vlardingerbrook, who've converted nice. very publicly to Catholicism. And, you know, this isn't an isolated incident or anything. It's, this is not just an isolated uh, phenomenon or some fluke. Rather, it, it caps off just the latest in a very, very long series of public conversions to Catholicism, especially by public intellectuals, uh, sure. by notable public figures, but especially by public intellectuals. What's driving this um, at the very outset? You know, Dave, and, and it almost reminds me of the quote we've all heard of, I believe it was Mother Teresa that said, you know, the Catholic Church is not a hotel for saints, it's a hospital for sinners, right? And one of the other ways I like to view the church, it's this vast garden, or it's this, there, there, are, there are thousands of doors through which you can enter the Catholic Church. You mentioned the intellectual route. There's people that are highly cerebral. They're driven by intellectual arguments and intellectual um, you know, reasoning and those names you mentioned. There's people who, I, I've seen people convert over th that, that walk through the church through what I call the bioethics door. You know, you have people that see that the Catholic Church is the sole voice that's crying out against things fully like abortion, like contraception, cloning, all those bioethics issues. You know, we've had people like R Lila Rose that came into the church for lots of those reasons. You have people who love the rich prayer tradition of the church. You know, people that may not have had any beef with God or any falling out with God, but they've been Christian their whole lives. They've loved God their whole lives, but they've noticed that there was just something missing. There was some kind of meat. There was some kind of substance. There was some kind of depth that was missing. And when they discover the Holy Eucharist, and when they discover the rich prayer traditions of the church, you know, like the Carmelites, and you, you have social justice people that are reeled in through the door of St. Francis, you know, the church's love and care for the poor. You know, you got Aquinas drawing in the intellectuals. I remember um, Deacon Alex Jones, who was a famous Pentecostal convert, uh, you know, he, he passed away, you know, years ago. But he meant what drew him into the church was the, the charismatic aspect of the church. You know, he was saying that there's over 75 million charismatic Catholics throughout the world. That's what drew him in. So whatever door you walk through the church, we have Jewish converts that see the deep Jewish roots of Catholicism. There are so many doors through which you could walk through the church. So it's hard to say that there's any one thing that draws in Catholics. I think it depends on the convert, and I think it depends on what it is that makes them tick. And there is room in the church for everybody. Yeah, I, I agree is. with that. You know, there's a, a richness to Catholicism where there's kind of devotions to meet mm -hmm. every person's charisms and predispositions. Um, you know, not everybody has to have a devotion to a particular saint. The fact sure. is, certain saints and their charisms are going to resonate more with certain people. Certain devotions are going to resonate more with certain people because ultimately heaven is diverse. You know, everybody in Absolutely. hell is practically 
the same. Uh, there are people who have given in to their, to their vices and turned their backs on God. But e heaven is a diverse place where all the saints are really unique. Their lives, their ministries were very unique, and they all glorify God in a different way. You know, the, God obviously um, has the absolute plenitude of all good in him. So any good that is being instantiated by a particular saint is going to really reflect just a different aspect of the glory of the triune God. So there is a richness to Catholicism where it does have something to offer for absolutely, you know, everyone. Um, but I want to talk about the intellectual tradition, too, in Catholicism. What sure. about the Catholic intellectual tradition is really making itself so appealing to so many public scholars? I think it's the depth of it. Um, you know, we were talking in, in the buildup to the show about just all these conservatives, you know, that are coming into the church. And obviously there's liberals who convert as well. But if, if we follow politics or if we follow the social conversation, if you really want to boil down society, it's really boiled down to the feelers versus the thinkers. Obviously, we know that the feelers tend to be on the more liberal side. You know, I feel like I'm other than what my birth assigned gender is or I feel this or I feel that. The conservative like puppy dog today. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, I feel like I need a third wife. You know, all these <laughs> things you can identify as, right? Um, although it'd be interesting if I identified as Joe Biden and tried to get on Air Force One. You know, I'm sure I'd be tased, and there'd be an FBI file opened up on me. So there are limits to identifying. Well, you the know, left we doesn't believe the things that they actually preach. That's a right. whole other mic'd up. You know, exactly. I mean, I can't identify my tax payments and monopoly dollars. I don't think that would work. <laughs> yeah. But, 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 but I said all that to say that conservatives tend to be more on the intellectual side, and they tend to be historians. They tend to study the patterns of societies that fall. And it kind of reminds me of a quote of Bishop Fulton Sheen in the opening of Radio Replies. Anybody who wants to be Catholic or who's even thinking about being Catholic, if you read Radio Replies, it's pretty much impossible to not become Catholic after reading it. And in the opening, he said that those who are married to the spirit of the age shall die with it, and that the Catholic Church shall live to chant a requiem on all the popular ideas of modern times. So think about that, Dave. There are so many popular ideas right now that really to the Catholic Church are nothing new. The Church has seen it all. The Church has dealt with it all. There's a treatise. There's a church council. There's a summa paragraph. There's an encyclical on pretty much any issue you could think about that arises in modern times. And I think that's what draws the intellectuals, is that they have this vast 2,000-year buffet that they can just draw from. And not only is there an answer to those questions or is there an answer to those problems within Catholicism, but there's a strong, overwhelming, convincing fire of the Holy Spirit conviction that the Catholic worldview on any issue you can think of is the right one. And I think that that's what drives people to come. Yeah, I, I think that's 100% correct. Um, there's a facet of just moral strength, moral courage, um, and contemptus mundi, obviously, that goes way back in the Catholic tradition, but also the fact that, yes, we have articulable and defensible answers to questions that have vexed even mainline Protestant denominations and, and fundamentalist Christians and, you know, all of our separated brethren. Sure. Um, you know, you go to the Catholic Church and you see not only the courage of their convictions, but also just a strong wrong answer to questions posed by the culture. And this is really the, the poison of modernism. That's why it is just the, the greatest of all heresies. It's all heresies combined because it, modernism is seeking to make the church ape the world. It's making it like the world as opposed to standing as a sign of contradiction that's set up by Christ to preach you know, virtues and truths that are not easily digestible to a modern world that's saturated with errors, you know? Um, so being that sign of contradiction, do you think that that, that the church as this visible light, as this beacon on a hill, is, is really standing out over and above every other institution? I mean, because there are other institutions that claim sure. the mantle of truth, but for whatever reason, people are gra gravitating towards the Catholic Church. It is. 100% it is, Dave, because if you think about it, I mean, the Catholic Church has not only the fullness of grace, right, with the seven sacraments, but it also has the fullness of truth 
right? It has the best of both worlds. And the fact is, I don't, you could take the most, and I don't want to, I don't want this to be like a, you know, a Protestant bashing party because we, we love our separated brethren. We have to reach out to them. You know, we have to practice ecumenism to, to the degree that it's productive and getting them to become Catholic rather than us trying to look like them and be Protestant. But I feel like a lot of these intellectuals that are coming into the church, a lot of them are extremely conservative. There's kind of a pattern that I've noticed. And because of that, they know that something is lacking. It's almost like if I could use an analogy, think of a conservative Republican, right? If I could reduce it all the way down to politics so people can kind of understand. What is the biggest pet peeve that conservative Republican have? Rhinos, right? <laughs> like, oh, look at this. In other words, conservative purist Republicans, right? They don't like compromised Republicans. Like, yeah, this guy might believe in lower taxes. This guy might believe in smaller government. He might be fiscally conservative, but he supports gay marriage or he supports abortion or he supports these other issues that they feel contradicts and undercuts everything else that he supports that they agree with. You could kind of say the same thing with Catholicism when you compare it to other Christian denominations or Christian groups. For example, uh, you know, I, I've, I've, I had a pretty big following on social media during the 2020 elections. Lots of conservatives, uh, you know, would follow me, would chime in, like it basically blew up my platform, right? But what's interesting is that there are certain limits to that conservatism. So, for example, a lot of people who are, you know, pro-life, for example, and again, I, I know this might sound harsh, but it, to me it is what it is. A lot of people that are pro-life are really just anti-abortion, and there is a difference to me. To be fully pro-life means to be pro-baby. So, for example, you could stand shoulder to shoulder with lots of good-loving evangelical Protestants. They march to D.C. every January. They write books against abortion. They do podcasts against abortion. They protest in front of Planned, Planned Parenthood. But when it comes to the issue of contraception, you cannot distinguish them from a secular person. A lot of them are dripping with the spirit of Margaret Sanger when it comes to birth control. And in my opinion, if you want to be 100 percent pro-life, you can't just be anti-abortion. You have to be pro-baby, meaning you cannot have any disdain for children under any circumstances. And unfortunately, with a lot of pro-life evangelicals, they have this and they may not even be aware of it. They have this hidden disdain for children in the form of contraception. Like they believe children should be prevented through contraception. They may be opposed to children being terminated, but they're not opposed to children being prevent, pre presented, or prevented. And in God's eyes, both have a disdain for children. At the end of the day, both are failing to be fruitful and multiply just in different ways. And a lot of people that convert to Catholicism, like Lila Rose, for example, they, they'll see that flaw in their pro-lifeness, and they're like, you know what? I got to go the rest of the way and become Catholic, because only in the Catholic Church can I be 100% pro-life, pro-baby, open to life in all of its forms. Sure. And that's a big reason, too. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, if only she would jettison the uh, latent feminism, and uh, then, yeah. which is obviously the font of sure. the anti-life ideology. But that's again another mic'd up. Yeah, um, she's a work in progress for sure. Right, right. Uh, you know, I think you touch on something very important here, and that's sexual morality. And I think yes. this is another place where the Catholic Church fully distinguishes herself from every other institution. Even even those that are nominally Christian, even those that are substantially Christian. Sure. Um, the Catholic Church stands strong on the issues of sexual morality, and because the sexual drive is the strongest human impulse, that really does, if you don't have this charism that's given to us by Christ, that's going to protect his bride, the, the Holy Church, and keep her pure in her doctrines, then you're eventually going to drift into error, especially on the issues of sexual morality. So I think, and the church has always been, at least in the last hundred years or so, 70, 80 years or so, it's almost seemed um, embarrassed of its own teachings on sexual morality. You know, we don't talk about this in public, you don't sermonize about it. It's something that the Catholic faithful a lot of times have to track down um, on their own. You know, they have to dig in their catechism and whatnot. The church doesn't speak too much on divorce and remarriage, at least in the sense where it is upholding its traditional teaching and speaking it out and reinforcing it um, in a, a culture that is, again, saturated with the evil of divorce. Um, you know, 
you can turn to a lot of places and get easy answers on questions of sexuality, on questions of contraception, on questions of marital conjugality and what is allowed in the marital bed, um, on issues obviously of divorce and remarriage that even many followers of Christ were like, if this is true, who could ever stand to be married on, on how he spoke of uh, the marital relationship in its Edenic form, where it's uh, uh, essentially a covenant for life, um, where you can't put away your spouse. How do you think that's figured in? To my mind, that is a strong reason and one of the first reasons that people start investigating the Catholic Church, and I don't think that gets enough press. It doesn't. You know, the, the, the topic of the indissolubility of marriage is so important because the biggest evil in society that we see right now, the door through which those evils are entering is the breakdown of marriage. I mean, the family unit has been destroyed. Um, the birth control pill has destroyed. It's, it's essentially, and I did a YouTube video on this a few years ago during Pride Month, you know, in quotes, obviously, um, about how the LGBT movement, if you think about it, you know, a, a court case that we all focus on is Roe versus Wade, and thanks be to God it's been overturned. But there was a court case that had it not been for this case, there would be no Roe versus Wade. It is the mother of Roe versus Wade, and that's this little-known court case called Griswold versus Connecticut, which basically legalized contraception. A lot of people don't know that, that there was a point in American jurisprudence where contraception was illegal. Once Griswold versus Connecticut took root, it basically turned... The sacrament of marriage, at least in America, from an indissoluble covenantal sacrament like you just mentioned to basically an adolescent arrangement that makes your kissing legal, right? Once marriage no longer becomes primarily about children, about the unitive and the procreative, it's only a matter of time before marriage is not only redefined but completely destroyed. So if you look at the LGBTs, they've been watching us heterosexuals for the last 60-plus years destroy and jettison marriage where marriage is no longer about children. It's only about who you love, right? Love is love. So then they think, well, what about us? It's, it's our turn. When can we get our shot at marriage if it's no longer about that natural law institution that it's been about for millions of years? And only in the Catholic Church do you find that full teaching about the indissolubility of marriage. I mean, how many conservatives even know what the phrase unitive and procreative means? Very few. And we could say the same thing about Catholics. We, we don't have, we have the teachings of the church, but like I said, this liberal compromised clergy that unfortunately married the spirit of the age in the 60s, part of that marriage, that deadly marriage, is they bought into modernism and they deprived the faithful of teachings that we have a right to, one of which is marriage. So, you know, I agree. And I, and I think that is another thing that draws in conservatives because, or, or not even conservatives, just intellectuals, they want to go the rest of the way. Like, they're already very conservative, but there's a—I think the most conservative thing you can do is to become Catholic, truly, because your sexual morality is 100 percent dialed in and regulated by natural law principles. Every act of sex is open to new life. You, you have that unitive and procreative. It's interesting. There was a, a, a saying of St. Augustine where he talked about when the unitive and procreative are abandoned. He didn't use that phrase. But he said that father-in-laws, that, that, that husbands become shameful lovers, brides become harlots, the marriage bed becomes brothels, and father-in-laws become pimps. Huh. That's what happens when you abandon the traditional Catholic teaching of the indissolubility of marriage. And people see that, and they want more. Yeah, no, that's right. And, you know, something that... I don't think gets enough attention because, again, the church seems embarrassed of her teaching on it and is trying to it soft pedal it in this age is the homo mafia and the mm -hmm. LGBT stuff that's going on right now. I think a lot of people, especially as Protestant denominations crumble and they, you know, are having the welcoming like pride church celebrations and they're getting rid of all um, aspects of sexual morality from their teaching, especially vis-a-vis uh, uh, you know, men uh, in, in same-sex relationships and women in same-sex relationships, um, obviously contra Holy Scripture, contra uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the exhortations in the New Testament, you know, people are looking at the Catholic Church and are like, oh, wow, her teachings are strong. Uh, they're imperishable on this. And that is a source of hope. And what's really pathetic and sad 
is that people are having to convert or come to see the light of Catholicism in spite of the bishops of the church, in spite of the church's magisterium that will not pipe up on this because they're afraid to, because they think that they're going to somehow offend worldlings and drive people away from the church when people are really hungry and thirsty for truth and they want to hear the truth about sexual morality and come into the church. So people are looking at the church's doctrines and tracking them down on their own, and there's this great silence in the magisterium, especially on the gay issue, but the world has even more silence on it, or obviously, as we know, affirmation of it. So it seems like that also is a major factor in people seeing light, especially as I think everyone's getting a little bit tired now. I mean, obviously, everybody should be completely tired um, of, of the LGBT propaganda. Everybody should be you know, filled with righteous anger about it. But I think even worldlings are starting to get tired of the LGBT propaganda. Yeah, they're getting real woke. They're, you know, and, and, and the thing, too, is, David, is it, this, this has driven me crazy my whole life, is I don't think people understand the fire that they're playing with when they view themselves as an open-minded person, when they're willing to flirt with error. Let me, let me tell you what I mean by that is how many times have you talked to Catholic? I, I've even talked to clergy that think it's cute to be a little bit liberal. You know, you ever see these memes that say, I'm not liberal, I'm not conservative, I'm Catholic. And, or, or sometimes they'll say, I'm a little bit liberal or I'm a little bit conservative, but that makes me Catholic. This whole notion of being okay with liberalism, a lot of people, when they think liberal, they think, okay, Barack Obama, Joe Biden, you know, civil rights movement of the 1960s. That's, a, that's the political shallow view of liberalism. But how often do we view liberalism as an actual heresy that has been formally condemned by Pope Pius IX in 1864 in his Syllabus of Errors? If you, want to, if, if you ever guys want to, want to check it out, read paragraph 77 through 80, where Pope Pius IX formally condemned liberalism as heretical. So when somebody says, oh, I'm just a little bit liberal on that issue, that would be like saying, you know, I'm kind of Nestorian on this issue. You know, I'm a little bit Arian on this issue, <laughs> meaning the denial of Christ divinity. You know, I, I, I believe Jesus is God, but I'm, I'm open to the possibility he may not be God. Well, you don't know what you're playing with when you go down that road, because faith and morals are in that order. There's a reason why we say faith and morals, not morals and faith. Why? Because faith governs what's true and what's false, what is divinely revealed and that which is not. So if you get it wrong, or if you're quote-unquote open-minded or quote-unquote liberal on the things that have been divinely and infallibly revealed by God who can neither deceive nor be deceived, according to First Vatican Council, it's only a matter of time before your morals compromise. So if you're liberal when it comes to the resurrection, or if you're liberal when it comes to the miracles of Jesus, oh, the actual miracle was not him supernaturally multiplying loaves and fishes. The actual miracle is that he got everybody to share. That's the miracle. He got everybody to share. He didn't turn two fishes into 4,000. That's the conservative right-wing kind of view of Scripture. No, you cannot be liberal when it comes to doctrine, because to be liberal is to be heretical, and you quoted well St. Pius X when he said that modernism is the synthesis of all heresies. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so that's important to think about. Well, and that's really true because the church is the oldest Western institution. The church is absolutely formative of Western culture. So liberalism, which is really a rebellion against classical Western culture, is really a rebellion from Catholicism. And that's something to think on uh, because, again, the church has given us every major important Western institution that we treasure uh, to this day. Um, okay, but it seems like more conversions around the bend. And I, I want to look at this because sure. even in Tucker Carlson's speech that got him, that apparently got him fired from Fox News, you know, he grew up Episcopalian and he's talking like, you know, he kind of scoffs at the theology that's at play there and maybe the liturgy that's at play there uh, in Episcopalianism. At, at the same time, he recognized that what's happening in the modern world, there's not a material, rational explanation for it. There have to be spiritual forces at work. Um, that are driving some of the evils 
animals that are so pernicious and counter natural, it can't be anything that's just, you know, we have a rational materialistic explanation for it. So he's aware of the spiritual combat that's taking place right now. And he's also aware of the limitations of his own religious background, of his own truncated Christianity. Uh, and when you start to become, you know, uh, kind of like Skynet, like self-aware like that, um, that's really when people start moving towards the Catholic Church. That seems to be, in, in any number of cases, uh, the paradigm. People become aware and they move towards the Catholic Church. You know, I don't think Tucker would become a Methodist. I don't think he's going to start going to the neighborhood Bible Church. Um, so I have high hopes that because reading the tea leaves now, uh, of some of the statements he's made, that he is actually on his way into the church. And same with um, Jordan Peterson, who has been spotted uh, with Bishop Barron. Uh, he's been spotted attending uh, the Catholic Mass. Um, he's even spent time at an Abbey monastery. And obviously, things like that are what brought uh, Shia LaBeouf into the faith, uh, spending time working on the Padre Pio movie, uh, spending time uh, kind of going through the daily aspects of religious life. Once people get a taste for these things, you know, they also are on their way in. Mm -hmm. But so I have great hope for that, um, that we have some very high profile conversions around the corner. And with those, there's going to be a downstream effect of people saying like, oh, what's bringing Tucker into the faith? What's bringing uh, Jordan Peterson into the faith? Um, I, I hope that that really does have yeah. a ripple effect. But why then? Are people not going to Protestantism? Why is it? Why am I taking for granted that you know Tucker Carlson's upset with uh, mainline Episcopalianism, but he's probably going to become a Baptist or Jordan Peterson? Why you know he's upset with kind of squishy, wishy-washy Christianity? He's going to become um, a fundamentalist. Bible Christian. Sure. Why is it that I'm assuming they're becoming Catholic and that Protestant is not drawing them in? I mean. John Henry Newman answered that question. To be deep in history is to cease to be a Protestant. You know, especially if you're Episcopalian. I mean, if you study the, you know, what is the rock upon which Episcopalian is built? It's not you are Peter and on this rock I'll build my church. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom which you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What Anglicanism is built on, and this could be part of Tucker's journey, is a divorce, adultery, and six beheadings, <laughs> confiscation of church wealth all over Europe. That is the rock upon which Anglicanism is built. And, you know, I, I think when Protestants, they're already sola scripturists, right? Like, they already believe in the, in, in the, the, the heresy of Martin Luther, of, of what's known as sola scriptura, for those of you who aren't familiar with that term. It's Latin for the Bible alone. It was one of the battle cries of the Protestant Reformation. And it's kind of like, if your car has a flat tire, why would you replace that flat tire with another flat tire? You want a tire that's full of air, that has more fullness. So why would a Protestant go from one denomination that believes in Sola Scriptura to another denomination that just believes in their brand of Sola Scriptura? I think they're sick of being their own pope. I think they're, I think they're sick of privately interpreting Scripture for themselves, which Second Peter you know, 1.20, 2 Peter 3.16 pretty much forbids in very clear terms that the scriptures are not to be interpreted for themselves. And I think they want a new brand of authority. I think they're tired of being their own authority with Sola Scriptura, and they want Catholicism. Um, another thing, too, is it reminds me of a, an essay that G.K. Chesterton wrote about what he called the three stages of conversion. And he basically talks about how when people become Catholic, and he kind of recounted his own conversion journey, and he basically said that the moment somebody becomes even fair towards the Catholic Church, that they're irresistibly drawn to her. That's all it takes. All it takes is for you to not hate the Catholic Church, and it's only a matter of time before you become Catholic. And if anybody's ever interested in looking that up, you can find it online. Just type in Chesterton, Three Stages of Conversion. And he talks about, if I can, if I can quote real quick, he says, the moment they cease to shout it down, they begin to listen to it with pleasure. The moment they try to be fair to it, they begin to be fond of it. But when that affection has passed a certain point, it begins to take on the tragic and menacing grandeur of a great love affair. The man has exactly the same sense of having committed or compromised himself, of having been in a sense entrapped, even if he is glad to be entrapped. And he ends by saying, but for a considerable time, he is not so much glad as simply terrified. And when I read that, 
It reminded me of this interview that Jordan Peterson gave about a year or two ago when he was exploring Christianity and he was choked up in classic Jordan Peterson fashion. We love his vulnerability when he cries. And he literally said that he's terrified of Christ because he's terrified that what he finds could make a claim on him. And I think it's only a matter of time before he's Catholic. Yeah, uh, I think that's right. You know, as, again, we go back to this concept of the church's richness and uh, its strong moral tradition, its strong intellectual tradition. And when I say strong, I mean superlatively so. And then it's the richness of graces that it offers through the sacraments in its claim, in its true claim, to be able to unpack the scriptures for us, these truths that all the other Protestant denominations uh, want to have access to, but really belong uh, to the princes of the church um, and the successors of the apostles. Um, you know, people are looking for what's in the Catholic Church. They're drawn to it. And this is why, and here's a, a statistic I just want to read from you know, basic Google search, but for every convert to mainline Protestantism, about 1.7 people have left the mainline tradition behind. And mainline Protestants actually have one of the lowest retention rates of all religious traditions, with only 45% of those raised in the faith continuing to identify with it as adults. So there's this sense of malaise, where I think you touched on it earlier, People are exhausted of having to, you know, pour over the scriptures to find their own answers. Of so They're exhausted of being their own pope. There's something comforting in being able to look to an institution that was founded, again, like you said, you know, not by Martin Luther, not by John Calvin, but by Jesus Christ himself. And, and people find succor in, in that concept, in that idea, in that institution. Um, okay, so... It, as, as much as it's really important that we do have these high-profile conversions because not only for the salvation of the souls of the converts themselves, but also for their downstream effects and bringing Absolutely. more people into the church and making the cultural conversation more Catholic and more rooted in Catholic doctrine, that's all really important and that's all very good. But I think there's some dangers also with... Um, you know, the flood, the torrent of people into the Catholic Church. And they're accidental dangers. They're not essential dangers. Uh, it's just something people need to be on their guard for. Uh, and I was hoping you could speak to this. There's this trend of making Catholic converts into kind of quasi-Catholic celebrities. We're, we're, we're almost making these people into mini prophets. You know, if a big name converts, they do all the rounds, they do all the podcasts, they'll be on uh, Raymond Arroyo's show, they might be on with like Marcus Grodi or now his son on Journey Home, and we almost make them into into prophets where we where Catholics are like these people have all the answers and I'm looking to them for leadership and and you see that with uh, Ava of Lardingerbrook um, and, and people are like oh what does she have to say now about this and I think you know these people good you're Catholic now now spend ten years familiarizing yourself with our doctrine with Catholic tradition with the Catholic intellectual rigor and then maybe start to speak I think is there a danger in turning these people into celebrities and many prophets before they're fully infused with the culture of Catholicism very very piercing observation David and I hundred percent agree because at the end of the day yes they're intellectual celebrities yes they have huge followings but at the end of the day, as St. Paul says, we have to give them time to go from milk to meat. You know, if, if I'm not mistaken, Shia LaBeouf is, is, is going through RCIA right now. If I'm not mistaken, don't quote me on that, but that's, that's, that's what I've heard. And, my, you know, my fear is with an example like him that everybody's going to look to him as the new Scott Hahn. It's like, guys, he just got started, you know. If Candace Owens comes into the church, which we hope and pray she does, right, my fear is that everybody's going to look to her as the new Kimberly Hahn, right? I mean, her husband, George, has been Catholic, I think, for five years. And I think he did a great job holding his own against that uh, Calvinist. I forget what her name was that he debated with Candace. But I agree. Not only do they have to mature in the faith, you know, we can't give what we don't have, right? So they have to get their head around Catholicism themselves. But even aside from the intellectual aspect of it, even aside from the faith aspect of it, 
When you become Catholic, you also have to acclimate yourself to the morality of Catholicism. Some of these people got to get in the habit of not contraceptive. I'm not trying to get in the bedrooms of some of these converts, but I'm sure some of them are, have been contracepting their whole lives. That's a huge shock you got to get used to doing. Um, the prayer flow of the Catholic Church, you know, they have to get in the habit of adoration, of the rosary, of daily mass, spiritual reading. These are things that take anybody time to get in the habit of. And I just hope that those on our side, that is one downside to conservatives, is that we always criticize liberals for how gullible they are. Like, oh, you climate change idiots, you pandemic idiots, you believe everything that your people say. Well, we have our own version of gullibility when it comes to people that say the things that we want to hear, those conservative talking points. And we tend to put people on pedestals and we tend to make idols of our converts. And I, I really, really hope we don't do that. Because like I said, it's a cliche quote, but the church is a hospital for sinners more than it is a hotel for saints. So that's a great observation, Dave. And I think we need to pray for these people. And I think we also need to make sure that we're not gatekeepers either. I'm parts of groups where the idea of Candace Owens coming into the church, there were even people in that group that says they hope she doesn't convert because they think she trashes black people too much or they, they just they hate who she is as an influencer. And it's like, who are you to say whether or not she gets access to the sacraments? That's the whole point of the sacraments. Well, that's true hatred, not caring for it someone's final end and wanting what's best for them. Obviously, there's yeah. no salvation outside the church. So if you truly don't want someone to convert to Catholicism, then that, that is the fullest form of yeah. hatred because it's saying you don't want them saved. You don't want them uh, getting sanctifying grace. And, uh, and it reminds me of the story of the prodigal son. You know, a lot of people think the righteous son is you know who he's a representative of, right? The righteous son is a symbol of the Pharisees in that parable, right? And there's lots of Pharisees that think that they have, uh, again, are gatekeepers. Listen, if Joe Biden wanted to convert and Nancy Pelosi wanted to actually become true Catholics and give up abortion, I would shed tears of joy. I, I would break down and cry. I'd be a mess. Of course. I would welcome them back into the church with open arms, even though everything they stand for, we hate. Right. People have to have the same kind of compassion for conservatives. Well, it's like getting rid of all your baggage so you can pass through the eye of a needle. You have to take all the baggage off your camel in order to get it Absolutely. through this small gate. And when people come into the church, they need to relieve themselves of their baggage that they've, these accretions uh, that have grown onto them through years and years of not living in the truth and being formed in a false tradition. So I'm, I'm honestly distraught uh, a lot of times by the fideism and the anti-science bias of people yes. that are making their way into the church and then becoming so-called like public intellectuals, public scholars, and they're just foreclosing and trying to shame Catholics who believe in something like theistic evolution or even, um, which obviously Pius XII says that you sure. are allowed to believe in. And it seems more and more likely that that is in fact the case, at least to my eyes. Um, mm -hmm. And things like extraterrestrials. You know, we had Paul Thigpen on last season of Miked Up, and he makes an interesting case Very interesting that show. there could <laughs> be, uh, you know, extraterrestrial life, and that's incorporated into the Christian tradition. Now, I don't buy it uh, because of things like the Fermi paradox. I think sure. it's mathematically actually quite, 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 quite improbable that there. Uh, is extraterrestrial life that we wouldn't have observed by now, um, that mm -hmm. wouldn't have had their radio signals detected by us by now. Um, but that's another point. People are just like, well, they're demons. You know, you have high-profile Catholic pundits just saying conclusory, bald, absurd statements that are way beyond their pay grade and their training. Oh, they must sure. be demons. Well, maybe it's just like a weather balloon or something, and it's not even some uh, extraterrestrial explanation for something. W was it demons building the weather balloon? But that has become a part and parcel of Catholic culture. And even, how about rejection of Halloween? I don't, you know, people not celebrating Halloween because it's the devil's holiday, because that's very Protestant to believe that. Uh, you know, because Halloween really harkens back to praying for the dead in purgatory. Um, and, and this Catholic fixation on death, memento mori, it's important to remember your death. And Protestants rejected that and invented this whole fable of it's the devil's holiday. Uh, to be anti-Catholic and to, mm -hmm. to thumb their noses at the church. And a lot of people now, it's like, well, we're going to dress our kids up as saints. Well, it's like, well, that's not the Catholic tradition. Um, and, and I'm seeing a lot of this come into the church as we treat 
Protestant cult, uh, converts as if they are prophets. And it's like, look, I respect you. It's a hard decision. It can alienate family. If you come into the church, if you convert from your Protestant background, your Jewish background, that can create hiccups. And it's an act of courage, and I commend you for it. But it's like you also took most of your adult life to realize what's patently obvious, that the church of Christ is the Catholic church, and that all of the scriptures point to this. You're not a prophet learn for 10 years. You know, and you've mentioned Lila Rose. It's like, well, jettison the feminism now because you're engaging in a disinformation campaign that's scandalizing people, promoting Mm -hmm. feminism because you haven't imbibed the Catholic culture and you're not familiar with the many, many Catholic encyclicals and papal speeches that condemn feminism outright. Uh, What do you, I mean, what do you yeah. think? I, am I no, overstating the case? Not at all. I, it, it's, here's what I think it is, Dave. I think, you know, when, when anybody converts, whether it's a private conversion of just your average, average, you know, salt of the earth Protestant, or if it's, you know, what we call a high profile conversion, I think there's a sense of marvel. There's a sense of spectacle to that. Because what's the heart of a conversion? If we really want to just talk brass tacks and just take all the romance out of it, The heart of a conversion is somebody saying, I'm wrong, and I've been wrong, and I've been so wrong about this issue that I have to completely reshape my identity in an ironic way that I never thought I would have to. I'm so wrong that I have to become a member of the Catholic Church because it's the only voice, it's the only tradition, it's the only institution that stands opposite to how wrong I've been. And I think there's just a baseline level of admiration we have for people, especially the smarter they are, like Jordan Peterson or Candace Owens or some of these other names we had a hard time pronouncing. Even somebody <laughs> like Robert. Okay, Robert Bork. Is that easy enough to pronounce? Yeah. E- even a guy, hey, even we're, a, we're in a bad place when <laughs> Bork is the easiest name to pronounce because it's got like a silent Q in there, right? <laughs> Bob Bork. Let's make it enough. But the thing, so even the smarter somebody is, the more of a spectacle it is when they convert because they're like, in spite of how smart I am, I am spectacularly wrong. And the only solution to how wrong I am is to become a part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So that is such a heroic public act that I think we just have a natural inclination just to put them on that pedestal. You know, I was worried about Milo Yiannopoulos, and I know he's a friend of church militant. I know you guys had done some work with him. Um, I, I, I was worried about him because I saw him on that pedestal. Not that you guys put him on the pedestal, but there were, there were so many people on our side that, oh, we finally got Milo. We got Milo. He's going to be our Trojan horse into the LGBT movement, and he's going to destroy all the gays. And it's like, no, we got to give him time to become ungay <laughs> before he, you know. Right. And that's just an example, right? But I, I agree with what you're saying, and I just think when somebody's willing to admit that they're wrong, Because if you look at Protestantism, and again, I love my Protestant brethren. I want you to come home to the Eucharist. I want you to come home to your Blessed Mother. I want you to come home to 2,000 years of unbroken apostolic tradition. It will truly enrich your life. But the thing is, it's rooted in rebellion. That's why we call it Protestantism. And what are they protesting, really? Are they protesting the Pope? No. They're really protesting, whether they know it or not, the full teachings of Jesus Christ that are contained within Scripture and without Scripture. We don't even have to talk about tradition. We don't even have to talk about the implicit teachings like purgatory or the Marian doctrines, even things that are clearly unapologetically taught in Scripture. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another committeth adultery. That is a clear scriptural teaching that your average solo scripturist is just completely blind to. So, I think a lot of these people get tired of rebelling. I think that they have that fight within themselves for so long, and they're like, you know what? Let me just surrender my oars. Let me just lay down my weapons against these ideas, and let me just see what it's like to not protest. Let me see what, it's, let me see what it feels like to not be my own pope, to not interpret my own Bible. And your only option is the Catholic Church, if that's where you're at. That, that's a really shrewd observation um, that, that, that you've come up with, you know. And not everyone is going to be Scott that humble? or St. <laughs> Paul. And even right. the apostles were wary of St. Paul for a while sure. after. And he, Absolutely. you know, saw Christ and, uh, you know, miraculous things were happening. But uh, those are very sui generis, you know, to be this like scholar that has this 
sees the blinding light and then can become, can jump right in to ministry. And it's something I think people need to be a little bit on their guard for because most people, if you're like me, you know, I was a cradle Catholic. I grew up Catholic. Yeah. I went to all Catholic school, 12 years, yada, 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 but I wasn't practicing mm -hmm. well. And before I could do anything in ministry, God really needed to purge for about a decade a bunch of baggage from me before I could be out there as serving as any kind of an effective mouthpiece at all for the gospel. And I remember praying to Mary after my conversion, like, please use me. I want to, uh, or my reversion, uh, please use me uh, to spread the gospel. And it's God was really kind of, I think, seasoning me. And that's what needs to happen with many people. Uh, at the same time, Absolutely. all of these conversions are a huge blessing to the church. Uh, Bobby, I want to give you, we're out of time. I want to give you just a minute. If I didn't ask you anything uh, that, that you think I should have, or if there's anything you wanted to say to the church militant audience, any last exhortations, uh, please, the floor is yours. What I want to say to the church militant audience, and, and even for people that are not in the audience, I'll start with our, with our CM followers. Do not leave Peter because of Judas. I respect a lot of the work that church militant does because they take out, and I, I hate to be harsh, but they take out the trash within the church that nobody else is even willing to acknowledge. And I know that a lot of times it can be discouraging to see all of these people in the hierarchy that are outed either for their blatant homosexuality or their cover-up of it or their pedophilia of it. Don't leave Peter because of Judas. Stay within the church. We need you. Don't become a Protestant. Don't, fall, don't follow in the steps of Martin Luther that sees all these wrongs and all these evils in the church and you put up your modern-day 95 theses of all the reasons why you don't want to be Catholic. Stay in the church. We need you. For those of you who are not Catholic... For those of you who are Protestants, again, I don't want you to just have a purely spiritual relationship with Jesus. I'm sure you have a great relationship with him. I'm sure you love Jesus. I'm sure you love preaching Jesus. But if you cannot experience his body, blood, soul, and divinity, your relationship with Jesus is fundamentally lacking without the Eucharist. And I invite you to full communion with the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. You want to be 100% pro-life? Become Catholic. You want to pray, you want to love Jesus the way he loves to be loved, especially during the month of June, which is dedicated to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Become Catholic and learn how to go to Holy Hour. Learn how to receive him every single day, not only as your personal Lord and Savior, but as Scott Hahn used to say, on your tongue and down your throat and into your stomach. You can't get more personal than that. For those of you who are not Christian, for those of you that have more of an intellectual existence, maybe you're, you're atheist or you're agnostic or maybe you have a Jewish background or Buddhist or Muslim or whatever, I encourage you to look at Catholicism. We have the answers for all of those questions you have. And if I can close with the quote of my confirmation saint, St. Anthony of Padua, he said, though we have a million questions, there is only one answer, our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. Thanks so much. Uh, signing off for another episode of Miked Up. This is David Gordon. God bless you all.